So hi, my name is Francois. <coughs> I'm an SC, a systems engineer, basically a pre-sales engineer for Cisco. I live in Portland, near Portland. And um, I've been coming here for about 15 years. This is my 15th Linux Fest in a row, which I'm very proud of and I keep telling everybody about. Mm. So, um, and um, today I'm here to talk to you about how you can use Ansible, the open source orchestration tool, with um, network elements, routers, switches, firewalls, that sort of stuff, made by us at Cisco, but also by other vendors out there, um, to, to do the same automation with those elements as you do uh, with your VMs and your ESX host and your uh, KVM host and in all the other things you do with Ansible today. So who am I? Um, I've been, I started my career as a Linux sysadmin. I have a degree in computer science. Um, I, I started my career early on as an as a open source advocate. I was very involved in the Tacoma Linux user group. I wrote a couple books on um, a series of books, actually the Linux Toolbox series, which are CLI reference books. Go buy them, I still get royalties. <laughs> um, and um, about 10, 12 years ago, I started transitioning more towards the world of networking. Uh, networking in the sense of like routers and switches and that sort of stuff. And about a year and a half ago, I joined Cisco. I uh, decided, hey, you know, I'm going to be uh, liking Cisco products for the rest of my life. I might as well go work there. So I'm here to talk to you about, like I said, Ansible. And, and, and at the core, I'm here to talk to you about automation. Automation of uh, a lot of tasks that are done repeatedly by People like you, who I assume most of you are professional admins, sysadmins, uh, in various roles and that sort of stuff. Um, one of the things I have to explain to people, and some of you, most of you here I, I think won't, but when I talk to network engineers, I have to explain <coughs> to them why they should do automation. Because there's a lot of people who are very happy spending their life SSHing one device at a time and making config changes. And it's, 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 there's nothing wrong with that approach, I mean, people have been doing it with SSH itself for almost 20 years. They were talenting before that. The problem is if you try to do things at cloud scale, which a lot of people are doing more and more even as customers of cloud, because I'm guessing most of you don't work for Google or AWS, you can't do what you've been doing the same way. There's a few seats here if you people want to sit down. Um, there's like, there's two on each row basically. Um, you can't keep on doing what you've been doing the same way, it just doesn't scale anymore. Some of the lessons we learned at Cisco, we, we deployed uh, several internal OpenStack cloud. And um, on, on, those of, on, on those clouds, we had thousands of network devices. You know, we would deploy a small virtual network and it, it needed a router, it needed a firewall. And we wanted to be able to turn them up faster than the manual processes we've been doing internally, which because our internal IT people face the same issue as other internal IT people most of you. And so we, we saw the need to automate and that's why we went to Ansible like a lot of people are. Um, another aspect of it is, so we at Cisco have products that have different operating system. Um, I know that may sound weird, but not everything runs iOS. Depending on your level of familiarity, some people here know this very well, some people don't. So uh, we, we, we have different OSs for uh, high-end routers, for data center switches, for regular stuff, so, and for firewalls. And managing all those things, uh, the CLI is, I would say, maybe 90% the same. So it's kind of like going from, like, I don't know, from Bash to Corn or something like that. I mean, your LS will work the same, but you'll try to do some advanced, I don't know, maybe even a for loop or a slightly advanced script, and things will work the same way. So if we can give an abstraction layer that makes everything work the same in the back, that actually makes it easier for people. And the thing we saw at Cisco internally is whenever people are asked to do things at cloud scale, they're never given a cloud scale amount of staffing, right? If people go from like, 10 years ago you had 20 servers, now you have 2,000 VMs to manage. Yeah, you're not getting 100 times the staff. Nobody is. So for that reason, you just have to automate. And, and the same things that we see as people who run OpenStack Cloud and, uh, and other people who run cloud see are the same pressures on staff are seen in enterprise IT. If, if you're a sysadmin in, in any organization, you're seeing the same issue on a smaller scale. Whether you're having to automate 100 machines or 10,000 machines, it doesn't really matter. You still have to automate things because you can't do it manually the same way you did when you had 20 of them. 
So the, the benefit of automation is there, regardless of how big you are. Very few people in this room, I'm guessing, are at a point where you have so few VMs that you can care for them manually. So one of the leading tools today for Ansible, for automation, is Ansible. It's an open source community project um, that was originally ba backed by its own company and then Red Hat bought them somewhat recently. And um, it um, gives people the ability to automate things in their infrastructure. There are several reasons for which people have been choosing Ansible for the last several years. The first one, one of the big ones are it's agentless. A lot of the other products, the you know, Puppet, Chef, Salt, that kind of stuff, CF Engine, the, those are the big ones that you've been hearing here, literally in this building, for the past five to eight years. A lot of those require agents to be installed on the elements being managed, and Sybil doesn't. And um, another reason for which network people today are looking at Ansible is that the server people and the developers, most of you here, are here in that group, have been using it for a couple of years. So Ansible is like one of the first orchestration product which is bringing together the, the developer, the server person, and the network person. A lot of the tools in the past were focused towards only one of those things, one of those audiences. Um, it's relatively easy to use, and relatively easy to learn. It's not one of those tools where you have to spend, you know, two full days getting it running. Or I don't know. Like if you want to get started with Nagios, it there's a learning curve, right? I mean, like, Nagios is awesome. I run Nagios, but you're not going to be up and running and, and doing significant things unless you have a couple of days to dedicate to it. Like you'll ping a server after maybe four hours, you know, and that's like <laughs> if you and nobody's interrupting, <laughs> right? So uh, Ansible is designed to not be as hard as that to do. There's still a learning curve, but I'm. What I'm going to be doing here is going back and forth between Slideware and live demo. So please pray with me to the live demo gods. It worked in my hotel room, I swear. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, but at the end of the slide deck, which I'll give to the next fest, or you can email me and get it, I actually tell you how to build the, the demo environment that I'm doing. You can, in two hours tonight, not in the time of two hours, but two hours from now, you can go sit in a corner and redo everything I did. And, and you'll have the files, and you'll be pushing literally config <coughs> to Cisco routers or other routers that can, that can tell you the same protocols. So the, the startup time, the cliff to get started is not steep. Um, another reason people choose Ansible is it's this, it's this hybrid community slash business backer support. I mean, a lot of you here have been coming to this kind of open source thing for many years, and you know which project are successful, it's typically the one that have the a strong community and business backing. If you only have one of the two, over time, as an open source project, you often have issues because <coughs> corporate IT doesn't want to run a fantastic piece of code that they can't call 1-800 support at two in the morning when it breaks. So this, the good thing with Ansible is you have the biggest open source advocate company behind it providing real support, that's Red Hat. But if you want to give them absolutely no money and use it forever, you can. It's, it's the best of both worlds, I think. Um, on top of that, it's, it's modular, meaning that there's a core piece of code, core engine, and then it uses modules that talk to stuff. So it's easy for somebody who wants to add manageability for their uh, smart fridge there to add a module that says, talk to my smart fridge, and then Ansible will deploy stuff to their smart fridge. I mean, I just picked a crazy example, but that's the whole idea. People can write module to talk to stuff. And it uses um, some of the more popular programming languages of the day, mostly Python. Another reason I'm here talking to you about Ansible specifically, this is the result of uh, the, I think, to my knowledge, the only Net DevOps <coughs> survey that's ever been done. It's, it was done between October and, I don't know, it ran for a few months. Uh, it's a survey of network operators. Um, and and the, those results were published on, in the last couple of months. So this is very fresh data, and you can you can find this online. I just put the two graphs. We not we, but whoever ran that survey. This is not Cisco back. This is like some independent thing. Um, asked a bunch of questions to network people like, what tools are you looking at? What you use, what tools are you using in production or evaluating or considering or don't know or no interest? And like Git, which is not an orchestration <coughs> tool, is it? code management tool is at the top, but the number one after that is Ansible by a mile. Like if you combine in production evaluating 
you're at uh, over 60%. Um, Puppet used to be very popular in the network world, but you can see the interesting thing about it is the install base is not that much smaller than Sybil, but people are not looking at it anymore. So the, the future growth, if this graph is a net grade predictor of future growth, in a couple of years, Ansible will, will be in blue around here, and Puppet will still be here in blue. So that's why I'm here to talk about Ansible. So what does Ansible look like overall from a very, very simplistic architecture? This, like I said, there's an orchestration engine. You feed it a host. It, this is like old flat text file, right? This is typical Linux software, the same way you've been managing software for 20 years. You feed it a, a file of host with names and IPs for it to work on. And it then has uh, plugins that talk to stuff. So, so in the <coughs> examples I'm going to show you, you're going to be, we're going to be using, like for example, SSH to talk to a router or a switch. You could be talking to a VM. And the users, us, are going to be feeding it something called playbooks, which are, like I said, uh, text files, which I'll be showing you more in real world what they look like. But at a high level, it's um, it's a series of tasks that you run against specific host. For example, I know this is a small phone, so I'm sorry if you're in the back, but if you want to install HTTPD Apache on a bunch of servers, you're going to say on my host, the web servers, I'm going to do this task, install HTTPD, and the actual task is with yum, I install it. So you're just defining relatively s simply and in a relatively <coughs> human-readable way how to, what you're going to do and which hosts and points you're going to do it to. Any questions so far? Oh, so for those of you who got here on time, you missed the announcement I made five minutes before I start. People who ask good questions get an Ansible hat. I'll throw them in the crowd afterwards, but uh, I'd like to have questions. I also have Ansible luggage tags. So, oh yeah, go ahead. Can you go back one slide? Yes. These, these playbooks, do you just like specify some set of commands to run to like do a certain thing, or how? How? I guess maybe you'll get to this, but what what exactly does it mean to like automate something or explain how to automate in a playbook? And what are the limitations, and what makes it more network specific? But that's, that's probably like the topic of the rest of your talk. But Let me tackle parts of your multi-part question, if you, okay? okay. Um, Ansible is not network specific. Okay. Most people have been using Ansible to manage. Uh, servers, be they um, be either bare metal or VMs, so far. The idea of using it for networking is relatively new. People have been using it for networking for a year or two. A lot of people in the world of networking don't even know about it yet. Whereas people have been using it in the world of um, <coughs> server management for several years now. So it's not network specific. Um, i trying to remember. Oh, so how you define tasks? So what you do at a high level in the playbook is you say, hey, I'm going to use um, a module or a plugin to talk to manage, um, I don't know, Red Hat servers. There's probably like an SSH. You're probably going to issue commands via SSH if you want to write your commands. So you'll use an SSH module that just push CLI, and it'll just do it. But that's not the more, the more interesting part. The more interesting part is if you want to do package management, you're going to have a package management module, which is smart enough to know to use YUM on Red Hat, for example. And then it'll make sure that every web server has Apache installed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think I'll have more minutes, but yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, there's a hat. Oh, give him a hat. First question, you want a hat or a luggage tag? Uh, hat. Pass it to the man over there, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, Ansible for networking, which is what I'm here to talk to you about. Um, I'm going to show you two, two ways of managing network elements with Ansible. The first one is the automation of issuing commands over SSH. It's what most people start with because if you've been configuring routers or switches the way you've been doing it is you SSH to them and you type commands. Um, so all my examples are going to be on, on Cisco gear, but um, because I'm going to use a module called iOS config, which basically pushes SSH command to iOS devices. There are modules like that for other manufacturers out there. So, and one of the reasons people look at Ansible that I didn't really mention <coughs> that much is not only can it manage the multiple type of product that we make at Cisco, but you can use the same tool to manage uh, network equipment from our competitors. I, I was on a call with um, a large web-based phone book company. Um, a couple, I can't give the name, but 
that restricts it pretty well. A couple of weeks ago, and they have a, a mix of um, like Juniper switches and Cisco switches, and they want one tool to push configuration to all of them. So that's their reason for looking at Ansible, and and their server people have already been using it for a while anyway. Um, but yeah, the iOS config module is this piece of community written code which you can download and put on your Ansible, just a bunch of files, and it will, when you tell it to, SSH to your iOS devices and slap SSH config to it. So if you want to see what it looks like, if a lot of people know what an access list looks like, because it's, it's the same on a lot of platforms, you know, whether you do IP tables at the end of the day or an access list on a Cisco router, it, it's written about the same way. And so in Ansible, you would, def you would write it this way, um, and it get, would then get pushed to a router, for example. The, the reason I'm using this as an example is I'm gonna sh give you a live demo of this, and I want you to see that it's not this new foreign language you have to learn. If you know how to write an access list, you, can, you already know how to do it, push it to a router with Ansible. There's no new skill to learn there. Make sense? That's a good question, which I think can be can be also asked: Is Ansible hidden potent? <coughs> I think would be the same question. Just he, you can't not when I don't say stupid stuff. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, He's nodding. Good. Okay. <laughs> so, um, for the if you didn't hear it, the question is: Is Ansible smart enough to be ran multiple times and not redo things it's already done? Basically, um, mostly yes. It depends on the module, but typically yes. Ansible is written and to be to have those smarts and to do it. If you use a module that doesn't give it that statefulness, that idempotency, then it won't. But um, and in, in the examples I'm using, I think I'm doing it the dumb way, meaning I'm just slapping commands. But you, the tool, if, if, if you learn to use it, has the intelligence to see, oh, yeah, that access list, that setting's already there, I'm not gonna slap it again. And when you, once again, when you run it, it will show you, you'll see this in, in just a few minutes, it'll show you in different colors as the output if you run it manually from the CLI, it'll show you this I changed because I saw it needed to be changed, <laughs> or this green I didn't need to change it, so it was already good. Okay, so it's built to have those smarts. That's always a good question. Okay, tag our hat. Can you pass the hat to the man over there? Thank you. To build on that question, um, is it also smart enough to determine the, the, the manufacturer of the, the router of the switch? So can you create? So, when it's a good question, when you when you use this module, the iOS config, you make the decision ahead of time. I'm configuring an iOS device. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about another protocol to manage network elements. That protocol itself is multi-vendor. So at that point in time, you no longer need, there's enough abstraction that you no longer need to ask yourself and identify who the network vendor is. You can just slap config to it, regardless of who it is. So I know I'm, I'm kind of like sidetracking your question, but the answer is, it doesn't really matter as much. H hat or uh, luggage tag? Hat? Can you pass it all the way to the back, please? Thank you so much. I just wanted to add that there are ways, though, to make that work. Like you, okay. can, you can write playbooks that will interactively like skip things if the host OS doesn't match, and then use variables to use the same rules in a different Thank you. you hat to luggage check for helping me answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> the funny one. <laughs> Pass the hat, please. I'm sorry, I keep talking to The guy with the red uh, hoodie about here. I have a clarifying question and a yeah. question about Ansible. So <laughs> Using like the, the word module, it seems like a module is like a like a unit of configuration work. Is that a fair way to work? Or, or it's like a piece of software that allows you to do configuration work? The latter. The playbook is the unit it's of uh, okay. the playbook which contains tasks is the unit of configuration work. The module is the piece of code that talks to the element being managed. Okay. So then my question is, uh, is there a way to like define dependencies between the <coughs> groups? So if you want if you want like some building block like oh configure you know IP tables this way, and then you want a few things that can depend on it, say like 
one for iOS and one for the hand of a router, for example. Is there a way to like reuse a playbook like that, or do you have to define a separate playbook for each one and like build the dependencies into it? So that may be something you do as tasks in a playbook. Jesse, help. <laughs> Re restate the question. Um, we said listening. Can you reference the playbook? Well, that's that's playbook. You can like define dependencies between playbooks so that like if I want IP tables on everything, but then I want separate things for Juniper and separate things for IP or for iOS, I can like have two playbooks, both of which depend on this IP table playbook. Or would you do yes. tasks yes. in a single so playbook? Yes. This is getting deeper into Ansible and further away from yes. the DevOps, okay. but there is a concept of roles, and a role is a collection of tasks, much like a playbook, but it's a little bit further down. A playbook can call multiple roles and a role can depend on another role. So you can have a common role that is IP tables that um, any anytime you <coughs> apply a role to a host, that thing can depend on the IP tables role. So you can be ensured that, that these pre-requirements are also ran every single time before you get to the, the meat and potatoes that you're looking for. Okay, cool. Any, thank you very much. Any other questions? Cool, yeah? It, it would seem to me that since Ansible is tightly coupled with Python, yeah. And since Python is Turing complete, anything that you want to do can be done. It's just a matter of figuring out how to do it. If you're willing to write your own modules, which the community is doing, the answer is yes, absolutely. The, the goal of Ansible is to, uh, for 99% of the users, be usable without writing a, a line of Python. But for the, I don't know, 1% or 10% of people who are willing to write their own module and do their own stuff, absolutely there's no limit because then you're calling your own code. And you just have this cool management engine to do it. Yeah, cool. Do you want a hat or a luggage tag? I would like a hat, please. There you go, last hat. Because we'll be the luggage tag from now. Okay. So, um, one of the things you'll hear about when you hear about uh, Ansible is Jinja templates. Jinja is a templating language. Uh, we find going into like the deep amount of complexity we can go, because somebody could probably give you a, a two hour talk on just on this topic. One of the things you do when you create configs for network elements is, or any uh, text-based config file in, in your life, you'll, you'll often have a config template in, in your text editor of choice, or some people even use Excel, and you'll have a series of commands with variables, and then you'll be like, you'll search and replace the word, uh, the, the hostname variable, and then they'll put it everywhere, that sort of stuff. So Jinja is a templating language that allows you to do that with Ansible. So if you want to configure the hostname of a device, for example, you'll just say, hey, my site code is, uh, Bellingham, and then everywhere where that's re referenced, it'll replace the site code variable with Bellingham, and then at the end of the day, you have a text file. The output of templating is the text that is configured and can be slapped on the device. YAML is the uh, st structural markup language that is used to write playbooks. It's, uh, defined, it's designed to be kind of like in an XML-ish kind of way, but more human readable than XML and at the same time still machine readable. So it's a way of just defining data. I'm, and I'm just giving you like high level concepts, which I think a lot of you here know about, but those are things you'll hear about. So when, when I show you um, some of the demo stuff, some of it will be written in YAML. Uh, some, an example is you can do, um, you, you can define, his how, here's how you would define like an employee record in a database, but like just using demo text files. The whole point is that it's both machine readable and because it's structure and structured and human readable. Okay, for the fun part. So I'm going to do a demo of slapping some config using the SSH, the iOS config module of Ansible onto a router, which is SSH in the hood. The way I'm going to be doing this is uh, we have a product called the CSR 1000V, the Cloud Services Router. It's basically the software image of a Cisco router but as an OVA, so you can run it on your virtualization option of choice. I'm running it on my laptop using VirtualBox and Vagrant. Um, so I basically have a full featured Cisco router running on my laptop and anybody can go and download it from Cisco.com. It's free to download and use for testing, free in the cost sense, not in the free software sense, sorry guys. Um, but, um, and you can do like up to, I think 100 kilobit per second of throughput. So for non-production, testing, prototyping use, you can play with this all day. What is that called again? The product itself is the CSR. Okay. Is there? Thank you. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I don't have my own. Oh, no, right away. Yeah. 
Oh. No. <laughs> Perhaps this is a garbage pen. It's a yeah. C, it's an S and a R. Okay, I'll, I'll just want to write. It's the CSR 1000V, okay? If you can't find the download, email me, or, I will, or take a card from me in the end, I'll give you the information. Um, so th here's what's going to happen when I do demos. I'm going to task switch on my laptop and forget that I'm in full screen mode and you guys don't see what I'm doing. So when that happens, raise your hand and yell at me. Sorry. We'll throw something at you. Throw something at me, but not a marker that doesn't work. Um, so on, in one window here, this I'm SSHing to my virtual router right now. So I'm at the CLI of a Cisco <coughs> iOS router. I'm making the window not very tall because otherwise the heads of the front row are going to block it. Is this readable in the back? Yeah. Okay. So just to show you I'm not lying, this is like a full on, I just did a shoulder for those of you who know Cisco CLI. I'm running iOS XE. Uh, Polaris for people who really know the Cisco product line. Um, and, you know, I can do. Uh, <coughs> like, this is a full on Cisco router I'm running here. Uh, this is a product that we created originally, well, I think mostly for AWS, honestly. We had customers like three, four years ago who were like, hey, we want to create <coughs> virtual private networks out in AWS, but we'd like to have like all the features of a Cisco router out there because. AWS is awesome, but their routing is very, very limited. So we took our code from a piece of hardware and just OVA'd it and said, yeah, yeah, run this on, uh, on AWS and please pay us. So, um, so, but yeah, so this is what it is. In this window, I have a very simple Docker container that a coworker of mine created with Python uh, and Ansible built in. The reason I'm pointing this out is, if you wanted to play with this, you can download this container and you can download the CSR and you can recreate this lab in no time. So the first command I'm going to run is this. So I'm going to call the playbook called iOS example, the YAML, because this playbook is a YAML file, I'm going to show it to you. And I'm going to run that against my inventory file, which I'm also going to show you. So my Inventory file <coughs> is your very typical list of hosts, flat text file, you know. And um, I'm going to be running it against this group of hosts called pod iosv. I have other groups of hosts here, which I'm not going to touch. This one is commented out because sometimes we give this demo with two routers. I'm just going to do everything once on one router. But if we had to, it would do the exact same thing twice in parallel, which shows, hey, you can do this 100 times the same thing, no sweat. And the uh, template, the playbook I'm going to run is, looks like this. So this is a sample iOS config deployment. I'm using um, passwords stored in my var files directory. I have a password, so this is like highly secured. And like my username and password is Vagrant, but my, it's Cisco as my password, right? Um, and um, I have a couple tasks in my playbook. I'm going to push an access list, which looks like this. And I'm going to also change, configure an NTP server as 9.9.9.9. So I'm going to do a couple show commands ahead of time on the router to show you that that config is not there and I'm not cheating. So there is no NTP server configured. If there was, this would have put it. Uh, I is like grep, if you don't know CLI. Um, And that access list is, I'm going to remove it. Oops, sorry. This window is not tall at all, so it makes, it's quite, there we go. So there's no access list there. So now I'm going to run this playbook. So this is, right now, Ansible is running. This is an Ansible run. It's uh, going to pushing to be pushing the configs to this. This is the IP. Like I mentioned to somebody, this is the card that shows, yes, I did things here. Things are changed. And that's it. It's done. Things are OK. And I made two changes. So let me show you now. 
my access list got deployed, right? It wasn't there a second ago. And my NTP server got configured. So yeah, the demo worked. Um, so not, <laughs> not in some exciting, but if I had done this to a thousand devices, it would have taken just a little bit longer and be a, absolutely not more work. And in the world of running um, typical corporate networks, you want to change things like uh, syslog servers or NTP servers or DNS servers, so authentication servers, that kind of stuff. Every, every now and then you're like, crap, I need to change the IP. I'm gonna have to SSH to a thousand switches. This is gonna suck for the next few hours. With this, it makes it a lot easier. Any questions on this so far? I'll go here first. Do you have a method for converting maybe copy-paste configs into playbooks? Or do you have to write each playbook out that you want? No, um, well, I guess it's the same thing. If you can basically, those are the lines, you can just copy and paste. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's not like real work. You you, you paste it into YAML. <laughs> <laughs> right? You came from the government. <laughs> what? You so came from the government. So like, <laughs> not real work. No, but what I'm saying is, by cop you can copy and paste it into a YAML playbook. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but if you wanted to template it and do different things on every host, then you use a Jinja template, which I'll show you in a little bit. I think there was another question back here. Yeah. Um, I know that Ansible has some degree of direct host input support, um, like on AWS, for example. Do you have any experience with that from a network perspective? Like, is there a way to... I wouldn't do it that way. I, what I would do yeah. is, because the, the, the mindset I would have is, Ansible is my master tool that sets up everything, therefore it knows everything. So I shouldn't have to detect things. I should, as I build my logic, know stuff. So maybe you're saying if, if it's an environment I don't control, like I just fire it up. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, because if you're doing this on, you know, a thousand hosts, yeah. Yeah, go for it. Um, in that type of environment, you're most likely doing asset tracking in some other system. So you're purchasing it, you're labeling it, you're throwing it in your data center. You would point Ansible at your asset tracking system rather than at self-discovery of switches. Because then you can get a list of all of your devices that you're asset tracking and narrow down based on the type to be able to form, uh, get at that piece of your inventory. Or if, uh, if you want... Or to continue uh, down the logic path, I was thinking, you, if you're using Ansible to create three virtual routers, the return code of that creation API call will tell you something like, yes, I just created for you this IP, and then you feed it into that. See what I'm saying? Okay. Does that make sense from a flow perspective? You should never be in a place where things are randomized and you lost track of what was randomized. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> You had a question. My, my experience running data centers in the real world is that things mysteriously appear. <laughs> <laughs> and That's nobody scary. knows exactly how something got into this secure data closet, but it did. Right. And so, in, in my mind anyway, discovery is really important. <coughs> yes. Because you never know what clowns facilities is going to let into the data closets. So you're right, but that doesn't really fall under orchestration. Like, you should have a network where you know when somebody plugs something in and they don't have access to the rest of, of stuff you care about. You should build networks like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's my job to help you build networks like that. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I consider to be orchestration. That, that's network management. If you Some of the terms that people use are like day zero, day one, day two, like, you know, first config, um, uh, then major config, then operation and analytics, you're in day two. You're in the running of a network. You, you may want to use some orchestration and call it in to remediate, but the ongoing detection is not something that's going to be done by your orchestration system. You need other network management tools, right? And Sybil is a fantastic orchestration tool, but it's not going to replace every network management tool you have because it's not what it's here for. Was there any other question? Can you automate handling it when something dies unexpectedly? <coughs> 
rerouting the rest of the network. Your network should do that. You, your network should be able to do that. Cool. Um, let me see what I'm going to show you next. So the other thing you can do is uh, with templates, I'm going to show you a different playbook, the iOS template playbook, where, um, so Jesse mentioned roles earlier, which are a way of defining that a host is going to do something and assigning things to it. I'm going relatively quickly on that concept. But um, in this, so th this makes the playbook itself be a lot smaller because all you're doing is you're assigning a role to some hosts and then the actual tasks are done um, in the role definition. I'm, I'm flying through this because I'm a little bit over on time. Um, I just want to show you real quick how you can do more advanced <coughs> config pushes on devices using configs. So this is a Jinja template right here which is, means basically it's a text file of a config with variables in it. And the whole role playbook call fills up those variables, creates that config as a text file, and then you can push it to a device. So as you can see, there's a lot of variables here that get uh, redefined at, at runtime, at Ansible runtime. So let me run this from the CLI. Here, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to generate a config. And what I mean by that is, um, in my playbook, I had a tag, which is the deploy, which is the actual pushing of the config to the device. I'm skipping the deployment. So all I'm going to do is output a config file. So this is basically just config file generation based on the template that I'm doing right now. And crap, I'm trying to remember which folder it does it. Uh, I think it's under config output. Here we go. Yeah, so it generated this file right here, which is the same file you were looking at templated, but the variables have been removed and like interface names have been filled, host name has been filled. And if I wanted to do it twice for two routers, for example, uh, the, this one is host name ASR1. This one is ASR2. What I'm showing you is you, you're doing config generation based on templates. So I'm going to now rerun the same Ansible playbook, but I'm not going to skip the deployment. So here, as you can see, the host name of my device is just router1. The reason I'm pointing that out is one of the things I'm changing with this template is the host name. So this one takes a little bit longer to push because it's not just like two commands, it's a whole bunch of them. Yes, Brian? So what happens when one of those commands fails? You've got a giant list of commands that looks like pushing out. Yes. Does that all push out autonomously? So with SSH, um, when one command fails, things can get nasty because you can end up with an inconsistent config. I'm going to shortly talk about another protocol that addresses that issue. But the, here, we're just using Ansible to automate SSH, so the same issues you have when you do copy and paste into SSH exist here. So real quick, my hostname has changed, meaning uh, all my config was pushed. If I do, um, there was a bunch of interface configs in there. Sub-interfaces, if 310, 320, those were added. So a whole bunch of config got pushed successfully via SSH. So thank you very much for the segue. There's a problem <coughs> with using SSH for CLI and automating SSH. There's, there's, a f there's several fundamental issues with everything I've been showing you. It's that SSH was created, well, or the, the, the CLI was created for humans to push config to devices. And it does that well. I mean, it's the, our CLI or the people's CLI are, have uh, built-in help. You can tap through it. You can <coughs> question mark through it. However, as a machine-to-machine -machine communication tool, the CLI sucks. Because if you push an access list with five statements and the third one that it doesn't take because you typoed something, well, it's still gonna push all the other ones and you're gonna be locked out of your device, for example. 
Um, and the CLI is not going to give a response or an error code to Ansible that is easy to interpret. You know, you have to screen scrape, you have to expect, you have to do that sort of somewhat nasty stuff to automate CLI that some of you probably have had to do in your careers and didn't really enjoy doing. <coughs> um, so the when you deal with machine to machine communication, which is what you're doing with with automation, you need to have a few features that make things work better. You need to detect when something didn't get accepted. You need to be able to roll back uh, config changes. If, if one out of your five access list statement didn't take, you need the entire access list to be rolled back, for example. You can't push a half ass access list because you're going to be dropping traffic, possibly your management traffic. You need to have um, error reporting like HTTP does. You know, everybody knows that the 404 means the file was not found. There's no way, there's no need to screen scrape that. The server tells you in a very um, systematic way what it does. The CLI doesn't do that. And if, if you do try to do even more advanced things like uh, get command output, screen scrape it, all it takes is like a space that changes or a tab that changes, and all of a sudden your screen scraping breaks in your SOL. So for that reason, the people who run networks decided to use APIs, basically machine-to-machine -machine communication instead of CLI, to manage network elements. And um, if you look at it from um, a, a logical perspective, if you look at your network element, your router, your switch in this case being managed, in the software stack, our devices or anybody else's devices, you have the features <coughs> that are configured, and then on top of that li lives today. If you ignore this, this is like the new stuff I would like to we'll talk about. If you look at how a router or switch has been done for the last 20 years, you have a CLI parser that then talks to the features and then takes to the hardware. That's the flow of information. Um, the networking industry has, over the last 16 years, decided to make things better by creating models that represent in an abstracted way those features and then exposing them to new protocols and those things are literally network protocols called netconf, resconf and grpc. The first one historically was netconf. It was created um, as a result of a big meeting that happened in 2002, an RFC that was written in 2003 and it was ratified the first time in uh, 2006. So NetConf is something that has been existing as an ITF standard for 11 years now. And what NetConf is, um, from a protocol perspective, it's an SSH connection. So you don't have to reinvent security like you did with SNMPv3, for example, which was a pain and nobody did it because it didn't work very well. Um, you end up having your management device SSH to your router on port 830. And on top of that, it's XML data transfers, so it's machine-to-machine, -machine, somewhat readable exchanges. Oh, cool. And it's a way to do RPC over XML over SSH. So that's the NetConf protocol. Not Cisco-specific, this is IETF-driven. Of course, we spend more R&D dollars on this than anybody else, but uh, <coughs> other companies are involved in this. The reason I put this here, this somewhat boring RFC full slide is to show that this is something that has a lot of maturity from an RFC perspective, the NetConf protocol. And the reason this matters is that um, the newer protocols that exist to do similar machine to machine, as in like, um, when I say machine to machine, I mean like Ansible to router, for example, automation. RESTConf is basically a RESTful flavor of NetConf. So the, the the issue with NetConf is when it was invented and ratified in the early 2000s, REST didn't exist. People were, people that were doing cutting edge stuff like, hey, XML versus H, yeah. So <laughs> over the last few, <laughs> right? It was better than CLI, but simple over the, um, the last few years, people have been like, hey, we should REST this shit. So they made <laughs> REST on. And um, gRPC is a Google invented um, protocol. They decided to do their own thing. Um, it, it allows for things like streaming telemetry, so it it's allows to do network management on even larger scales and do slightly different things. P people who do very cloudy stuff look at gRPC, but people who just want to manage a bunch of routers and switches today are doing it with NetConf. Res ResConf was ratified as by the IETF as a 1.0 standard in February of this year, so this is very cutting edge. This is supported on most devices that you buy today from us, from Juniper, from Arista. Some better than others, but it exists. 
So how does NetConf work under the hood? I, I told you guys it was RPC, which means that basically you're issuing commands in, um, in uh, XML format, like I said, SSH under the hood, and the commands that are issued are commands that look like your traditional CLI commands. You know, there's a get, which is like doing a show command. There's get config, which is like a show run. There's edit config, and other config manipulation commands. You can get this high if you want. Um, so I'm gonna skip through this real quick, but this is to show you that this is somewhat human readable. This is what a get config looks like. You know, it's the beauty indented of an XML thing, but at the same time, you can tell what you're doing, right? You're doing a, this is a show run for gig zero. This is the same thing you've done from the CLI. You're doing it this way. The response is also what you know how to read, just packetized, um, wrapped into XML. Edit config is the same kind of stuff. And the, the good thing, uh, the benefit of this is there's responses to it. There's response codes. The thing will tell you, yeah, I'm okay, like HTTP would. You know, you don't have to screen scrape whether you're okay or not. So Ansible, as of 2.2, which is, has been out now for a little bit of time, can do this. There's a module called the netconf config module, which before we were using the iOS config. So this module is, uh, was, I think, written by some colleagues of mine, but it was written not to be Cisco specific, so you could use this module on competitors' products if they implemented NetConf properly. Some of them haven't. <coughs> um, and you feed it this XML stuff, which is a little bit overwhelming at first, but if you think about it, this is how you configure an NTP server. The same thing I showed you earlier, you know, the one line of command to configure an NTP server. If you monkey see, monkey do, you can, look, you can figure out that you're doing the same thing here. And the one trick that I give to people, if you want to get started with NetConf, you can download your entire config via NetConf and then do edits in it. So uh, as a way to learn how to do this, you know, d do stuff CLI the old way, suck it out in NetConf, see how it's done, and then you can push it back that way and change it. Uh, this is like a trick on how to learn this. Right? Um, so I'm going to show you Ansible, now using NetConf to talk to the router. So here's the, let me close some files here. Console, why are you doing that? I'm looking at the NetConf XSD. It looks like there's a lot of room for interpretation inside there. Is there like a standardization within the NetConf XML? Yes, the operations are standardized, like the get, that kind of stuff. So the yeah, RPC but within, type. Within that, like the, the services and stuff like that, it looks like there's a lot of room for. Yes, okay. You know. <laughs> I did not pay you to. to it smells to like a lot of room for arguing. Yes, so, <laughs> okay, there's a concept I'm going to introduce real quickly because I have 12 minutes, le right, 12 minutes left, but Sorry. it's something you're going to hear. When you hear people talk about netconf, typically they talk about netconf slash yang, Y A N G, which stands for yet another next generation which is a, <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't come up with that name, okay. It's a, do you remember the, the, the diagram I showed you with the data model in, in, the, in the switch, and that's what you're manipulating? So the configuration of your network device is modelized using what is called a Yang model, which is kind of like a MIB in the world of SNMP. And so, and those are also IETF driven or proprietary, there's both. You can actually uh, find those Oh, I didn't configure the Wi-Fi. Um, they're stored on GitHub. Like the entire industry has agreed, let's all work together and put them on GitHub. So if you just okay. Google GitHub and Yang, you'll get straight to the page where all those repositories are. So what you're manipulating with NetConf is the data constructs that you're manipulating are actually Yang models. And if you look, I, I skipped over this because because of time limitations, but if you look at uh, here, this line right there is actually the model that you're working on. So you're not working just with the config, the Cisco config. You're working with the interface config modelized by Yang that everybody in the ITF agreed on. And that's why there's actually proprietary and um, open models. If you take out the configuration of an interface on a router, the same way you had standard MIBs, 
with SNMP where everybody agreed that it should have a name, an IP, a description, uh, up down by uh, boolean, uh, speed, you know, and packets in, packets out, right? A few standard variables that every vendor is going to implement the same way. And if you do an SNMP get on that OID on any managed device, you're going to get the bits in, bits out. The same thing happened for Yang. There's the same models that look exactly like the MIBs that everybody defined. But then if you take a Cisco router, we have like 100 features we implement on an interface, features some of which are proprietary. So we wanted a way to modelize that, so we have an, another model, the pro proprietary model, which has all those features modelized in it. If you use that model, if you do those RPC calls to that, on a Juniper router, it's going to error out because they have their own features. But the common point between the two, uh, like packets in, packets out, will work the same way, which is why you can use this to do basic things on every, com on every manufacturer's hardware. And then if you want to do Cisco-specific thing, of course, you have to use Cisco-specific stuff. This was very, very quickly something that normally takes 15 minutes to explain. So if, if, if I didn't do a good job, I apologize. I'm happy to talk to you guys afterwards. But that's, the, that's it at a high level. That's why this is called NetConf Yank. NetConf is only the protocol used to talk to the device. Right. Whereas with SNMP, SNMP was both the UDP-based protocol to talk to the device and the modelization, the MIB and the OIDs. Here, this has been broken apart. NetConf talks to it, and Yang stores the data. I hope this is clear. Somewhat to people. Better, yeah. So, um, quick netconf example right here. I'm going to do the netc example playbook, which uh, same thing. I'm uh, working on the same pod of pod of hosts, and I'm going to be slap using Ansible to um, slap this config, which is now written in XML format. Let me zoom a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to be pushing an NTP server 5557. I've already showed you that it's not configured and I'm not cheating. So um, let me run this. So it worked, it made the change. You can still see the show run INTP a few lines up. Here's the new one I just pushed. So in the back end, Ansible called the NetConf module, and um, that module made an SSH connection on 830, sent a bunch of code, um, an RPC operation over XML. All that was completely done in the back. All I had to do was give it the XML payload. You had a question? Are you going to show a failure? Heck no, when it works, I'm happy. Yeah, okay, you have a good point. No, I'm not going to show it. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not going to show you a failure today. But yeah, um, you're right. The benefit of doing it this way is if I were to, uh, you, you know, it's not a bad idea. I should have an example where I'm, I have one of my lines and access list that's bad and it mm -hmm. shows and rolls back the whole thing. But, but I don't have one. Address on one of the NTP servers to be an impossible ID and have it go. Okay, let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how well this is going to fail. The so here's the trick: the, on this platform, the 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 module, the way it's written, doesn't use the whole idea of config candidate, which allows to work on comp uh, on candidate configs that then get applied or rollback. So I don't know how well the error handling is implemented here. Let's find out. <laughs> Can I save this? <coughs> what? I hope it doesn't just like say like okay and move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Echo dollar question mark. Uh, I, I need to move on. Self will exit one on failure. So you will get a, a bash failure uh, code then. from Ansible itself, yeah. Yes, yeah. okay. right. Like right now, I would say, I would say, okay, cool. So uh, okay, I gotta move on. But okay, it fell. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> <You> happy now? <laughs> <laughs> Here, grab a look at your Yeah. So okay. Um, so things to like about NetConf. Um, oh yeah, one thing I didn't mention. All the Yang models that I talked about, meaning all the data structures that store the data, like interface data and all that, you can download them from the device you're managing. So when you're writing this, it would be like as if you could ma download all your MIBs, like fully described, you know, detailed, 
from a router or switch or server. Typically, you don't do that. You have to go to the manufacturer website. You want to manage an APC UPS, you have to go on the APC website and find the MIB. With NetConf and Yang, it's self-documented. You can ask the device that you manage, hey, tell me all the models that you support, and you can actually download it from it over the NetConf protocol without having to do some out-of-band crazy stuff. So there's a lot of stuff to like about NetConf, plus transactions <coughs> and notifications when things fail, as we saw. One of the questions that people often ask me at that point in time is, wow, this is great. I, didn't, I did not know your Cisco routers could do that. Which platforms support that? There's, uh, if you go to our developer website, developer.cisco.com, there's a page that keeps up to date a version of this table. But at a high level, a lot of the stuff you can buy from Cisco and a lot of the stuff you can buy from Juniper and Arista will support what I just showed you. The last thing I'll show you real quick is what you can end up doing with this is um, the whole concept of infrastructure as code and configured abstraction. Let's say you have in an organization somewhat siloed network people and server people, which is still often the case. Mm -hmm. And the, the network guys, of course, will never give um, config access to the routers and the switches. But the server people, I use the word guys generically, okay? The server people are the ones who uh, deploy new services. They deploy like a group of servers and it would be nice if they could deploy uh, routing for it. You can have an agreement where a, a basic template based on something that does not look like network config can be written by the server people and that gets fed into Ansible and then that gets pushed into the network. So if you look at this, this is an example of, um, uh, we have this thing called Campus Fabric, which is a way of doing multi-tenant <coughs> networking on an enterprise network outside of the day center. And um, to configure it, traditionally you have to be a network guy. With this, you could have your, um, like your help desk <coughs> lead, you know, somebody who's like, has some amount of IT smarts, but is not a network person. Say, hey, I'm going to add another tenant on the network. We're gonna have some organization using a few offices in one building. So just by filling out something like this, which could be, which is just a text file, without having to know how to configure a VLAN, without having to know how to configure a VRF, if you know what it is, a virtual routing instance, that kind of stuff, just by putting something like this, you feed this into Ansible, and that can then configure, do in the back some very, very complex configurations of VLAN and VRF on ent an entire infrastructure. So the, the whole idea of infrastructure as code is one of the things that tools like what I've been showing you enable. They allow non-network people to do complex things thanks to templatization and all that. And worst case scenario, the ability to screw up from the non-network person, which is what network people always care about, those people are gonna screw things up, is somewhat limited. They can only do those few things. Um, I'm not gonna show you an example because I'm out of time. Um, oh, let me show you real quick. Uh, next few things, if you want to know, learn more about this, uh, for those of you in the area, so there's a series of classes called DevNet Express, which are free. <coughs> there's one hosted in Seattle on June 6 and 7. I'm teaching on this topic and other topics, and those are actually worldwide classes. So if you go to this website, you can find more classes on these topics that are free. And if you want to learn more, we have our big yearly conference called Cisco Live. It's in Vegas in June, and then we have it in other places around the world. So, but this, you have to travel and pay. This, if you're in Seattle, it's free. You can just show up. Well, you have to sign up first. And um, in the slides, which I'll put on the next fast, there's a bunch of links. And also, at the end, there's a couple slides on how to rebuild the environment I had. So I give you steps on exactly how to do if you want to play with this on your laptop without having to use a real router. Everything is available. And that's it. I'll be around if you have questions. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Like, uh, to secure that communication, uh, even though you're using SSH, uh, for, uh, like using keys instead, or...